I'm Hayley and I'm a campaigner for Stop Killer Robots. This video is part of a series where we explore digital dehumanisation. Digital dehumanisation is a process where humans are reduced to data which is then used to make decisions and or take actions that negatively affect our lives. In this video we're talking to Dr Matthew Gariglia about surveillance and the rise of robotics. Hi, so what's your name and what is it that you do? Sure, I'm uh, Dr. Matthew Gariglia. I'm a policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, and I uh, research and um, am an activist focused on privacy and surveillance from governments and where that surveillance overlaps with consumer privacy. Could you describe yourself in three seconds? Uh, three seconds. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a historian, researcher, and activist of state power. Why is it important that information remains our own? Well, I think what information is, is its vulnerability. When you give people a lot of information on you, um, that could be totally trustworthy, right? With more information on you, you could be served with more convenience. Um, if people know your wants, your desires, your schedule, your routine, there is room to offer you with uh, convenient solutions. The problem is that that also represents vulnerability. Um, what people, what a bad actor, what somebody wishing to do harm to you can do with that amount of information. We hear quite often that if you've nothing to hide, why does it matter that your data is collected? What would your response to that be? Well, the, the answer is, that uh, you do not know if you have anything to hide um, because history is full of people thinking they were doing nothing wrong, um, which that information could be used against them eventually anyway. Um, so, you know, your relationships, your religion, your ethnicity, your immigrant status, all of these things are, are information about you that is collected. Um, and you might not have anything to hide about that information today, but you have no idea who will be in power tomorrow. You have no idea who will get their hands on that information in the future and what they plan to do with it. What would you say to people who think that surveillance technologies are a good thing? Um, I, I would say the same thing. You know, surveillance might seem like it's making you secure today, um, but just in proximity to your own life, that surveillance equipment is picking up a lot of information about you that also makes you vulnerable. Um, it's not just the people across the street. It's not just the potential burglar trying to, you know, scale your fence that it's picking up on. It's also, you know, the conversations you have when you're coming in and out of your house or the conversations you have on your phone while you're sitting on your front porch, what have you. Uh, and so that that uh, surveillance equipment, um, it might be serving you with convenience. You might think it's making you feel more secure, um, but really it's, it's also making you more vulnerable to outside actors as well. What is the current scale of surveillance in and around the home? Yeah, you know, the average home is, is filled with um, potential vulnerabilities when it comes to cybersecurity, when it comes to surveillance. Uh, the more smart home devices you have, if you have uh, you know, audio triggered assistance in your home, which are connected to the internet, your cell phone, your computer, the internet, all of these things, whatever is collecting information on you that is being stored elsewhere makes you more vulnerable to, to hackers who want to record things in your house or want to get footage of you, who want to read your emails, who want your financial records, um, to police who are interested maybe in you know, your relationships or, or what you do politically, who knows? So who owns our data? That's a, who owns your data is, is the question of our times. Because, you know, you might trust your cell phone carrier with your data because it's a big trustworthy uh, company, but you don't know who's going to buy your company next and what they're going to do with your data. That company might be selling your data to data brokers and to advertisers who in turn sell it to other people, uh, who in turn give it to the government. So really the question of who owns our data is becoming more and more um, elusive and more and more troubling. Your article mentioned situational awareness. What is that and how does it affect us? 
Yeah, I mean, part of it is understanding, you know, your your personal threat model is who are you worried uh, might get your information? What's the worst thing that can happen if somebody got their hands on that information and doing what you can to protect that? Um, you know, not reusing passwords from a compromised website to also uh, run your your home security system. Um, because we've seen when that sort of thing happens, bad actors can plug in the password and username from a, a data breach website, and they can suddenly have access to your home security system. They can see you and hear you. Um, and so being aware of what in your house is most vulnerable and how to protect it is incredibly important. Can you tell us more about Nightscope? Uh, Nightscope is an autonomous uh, robot company which provides these systems to private entities, to police departments, um, which are just patrol robots. They are out there right now. There are you know, probably hundreds of them at this point that are uh, out there patrolling. And they have cameras, they have microphones. Um, there have been some records in the past that they collect data from your cell phone pinging off of. Uh, equipment inside them. Uh, they can potentially read license plate readers and they are being deployed by, you know, in public parks, in parking garages, by shopping malls, all sorts of different entities are buying these robots and deploying them. Your article mentions government departments looking to use robot dogs, but is this technology accessible to private entities as well? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, you know, it, these things are quite expensive as of now. Um, so you have, like I said, when it comes to night scope entities like shopping malls or uh, private parking garages deploying them in, in attempts of, you know, keeping their customers safe. Um, but but because the these things are very costly, one of the biggest um, potential buyers of them is the government. So their Department of Homeland Security, their police departments, entities with massive budgets who are still and always looking for a kind of technological silver bullet that they think will come in and answer all of their problems. And for some people, they were investing a lot of money in the idea that robots will be one of these silver bullets. So there's a big question mark about CCTV and its effectiveness. Can you tell us, does surveillance stop crime? The big thing to ask uh, uh, when, when it comes to the, um, when it comes to whether or not surveillance prevents or stops crime is one, uh, if surveillance stopped crime, why do we have so much surveillance footage of crime happening? Uh, clearly, people are not deterred uh, by cameras, by surveillance when they are intending on committing a criminal act. And so some people will retort, well, the footage will help you get conviction. They will help you put people in jail for committing those crimes. But it invites us to ask the much larger societal question are, do convictions lower crime rates? What actually prevents crime? What stops crime? Um, because crime, you know, as a historian of crime and policing, crime kind of ebbs and flows no matter what initiatives are happening out there, uh, no matter what police are trying to do. So the more surveillance we have, supposedly the more convictions we have, um, if if crime doesn't fall, then what? Then what is the next solution we're going to turn to? Because eventually we have to ask these bigger questions about uh, what actually causes crime and, and do more cameras, are they going to stop that? How is the rise in surveillance linked to the rise in robotics? The, the massive, massive amount of data that can be collected now um, is useful. It's useful to a lot of things, one of which is uh, the rise of robotics, because robots, especially autonomous robots, require a tremendous amount of, of co already collected data and continuously collected data in order to allow it to run. So all of these, uh, you know, supposedly autonomous Robots going out there all have cameras, they have microphones, they're collecting all this data. And whenever you have that amount of data being collected, eventually governments and law enforcement are going to ask for it, um, which means that you have just these big roving uh, surveillance devices, which you know are you know ostensibly a, an autonomous robot, but are also just a massive surveillance machine. Can you tell us about the approval and the subsequent backlash against armed robots in San Francisco? Yeah, so in California now, we have a new law which requires police departments to pass through a municipal uh, legislative body, a, a, the use policy for law enforcement technology. 
one of the things that a lot of police departments have um, increasingly is ro remote control robots, which are supposedly used for bomb disposal. They are robots that, you know, come over from the military and you're supposed to use them to approach a suspicious package or a device which might be explosive and unstable. Um, and in the in planning for, you know, the impossible, the police departments, a lot of them are seeking approval um, to strap uh, either maybe guns, but in the case of San Francisco, explosives onto one of these bomb disposal robots and to use it like an improvised explosive device. Um, that in an unlikely scenario, they wanted the authorization to uh, send a remote control robot strapped with an explosive toward a you know, uh, potential threat and to blow it up. Um, and at first, the Board of Supervisors in the city of San Francisco approved that policy. They said that it, under um, very vague language. The police would be able to uh, use this power to throw up the blow up and a, and a potential threat. Um, the community found out about this. They watched the first vote. Uh, people were very disturbed by what they saw as a, a really large and sweeping authorization for police to use these powers. Um, and there was, you know, a frenzy. Um, activists, community groups were up in arms and were calling on supervisors to reverse course. The Really, frankly, the entire world's media descended on San Francisco disturbed that this could set some kind of a precedent for uh, police using armed robots. And within one week, we were able to reverse course. And um, as of right now, until the policy language is revisited, we have a full ban on police using deadly force with robots in the city of San Francisco. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation played a big part in that, right? Yes, we were. Uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation has had policy uh, a policy position now for quite some time that we are very much against domestic policing being done via by armed robot, um, and that's in remote control or autonomous cases. So when that popped up uh, in our backyard, we felt very well situated to, to step out in front and to um, do whatever we can to really organize a lot of community groups that were also very concerned. So we were, we were um, very instrumental in working with a large coalition of civil rights groups and community groups and racial justice groups uh, to try to put pressure on the Board of Supervisors to reverse course. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing? Um, I, I think for a lot of people, the conversation about policing as done by robot, whether it be remote control drone, remote control robot, or autonomous robot, is that this is a far-fetched conversation that we don't need to be having yet. Um, but it absolutely is a conversation we need to have now, because whether you like it or not, uh, whether you think we're you know deluded by visions of RoboCop or the Terminator or not, uh, these this thing these are happening. And I, one thing I really wanted to make clear. Um, in working with Stop Killer Robots, is that at the at where we are right now on the landscape of data surveillance, data privacy, and the rise of robotics, is that uh, autonomous robots are already out there. They're already on patrol. Police departments are getting more and more eager to arm both remote controlled and autonomous robots. Um, and there are a lot of companies out there that see a huge uh, paycheck to be made when it comes to getting out in front of this and selling and, and manufacturing these types of devices and weapon systems for police departments. Um, so the time to, to act, the time to be concerned, and the time to start passing protective legislation against armed robots and armed autonomous robots is right now. So if you want to take action to stop killer robots, the first thing you can do is like, share, and subscribe to these videos. It really helps get us out there. If you want to know more, visit stopkillerrobots.org forward slash take dash action to sign our petition or contact your political representative.